Today we're in Genesis chapter 18 and we're beginning a series, uh, probably four or five episodes, where we're going to look at the first half of Genesis and the story of Abraham and Sarai and the circumstances around uh, his life and the life of his family. And we're looking at the first half of Genesis at chapter 18 over the next few episodes and it's called I've called today's episode, How to Deal with Doubt. And I suppose I'd like to begin by asking you, have you ever doubted the Lord? Now, I don't mean, have you ever doubted that the Lord existed? I'm not asking, if I'm also not asking, have you ever doubted that the Bible is the word of God? I'm not even asking you if you've ever doubted whether the miracles or the stories in the Bible are true. Are true. Those aren't the kind of examples of doubt that I'm going to talk about today. I know a great many people listening to this podcast would probably say, I think at an educated guess, that they would not tend to have doubt on the basis of those types of questions. What, but what I'm specifically addressing today and asking you is, have you ever doubted the Lord in any part of your Christian life? Now, in my Christian journey, I frequently come across people who seem to, that to me, the main doubt that they have is that the Lord has forgiven them. And this is often, this question is brought up in their mind because of somewhat, something that they perceive as a huge sin in their background, something in their life that they really question, can God really forgive me of that? In my life, I've spoken to Christians who've had affairs in the past, and even though their spouses have forgiven them, they wonder if they really could be forgiven by God. I've also spoken to quite a few people who feel guilty about the actions during times when perhaps they were trapped in a downward spiral of addiction. Some people feel guilty about things that they did during difficult times of their life. And some people I have met feel th still feel guilty about things they did in their childhood or particularly their teenage years. Now these are mature people. They know the Lord, they know the Bible, they love the Lord, but they still can't come quite to believe that God has forgiven them for something they have done in their past. So I suppose I'm asking you, do you have a big issue like that in your life, friends? Do you ever wonder sometimes if the Lord has really forgiven you? That's the kind of doubt we're talking about today. I'm talking to you particularly, if you, if you sometimes feel that because of bad situations in your life or in the past, that you really struggle to believe that those things that you did can really be forgiven. Now, some people struggled with this, particularly if they're drawn back to old corrupt ways of doing things that they believe it isn't possible for them to be forgiven. I wonder if you've ever had to deal with those types of doubts. Have you ever talked to anybody who's had those types of doubts? And maybe the question is, how would the Lord himself deal with someone who's struggling with those kind of doubts. Well, thankfully, we don't have to guess about this because this incident that's going to be described for us in this chapter of the Bible, we see the Lord himself deal directly with that type of doubt when it's expressed. What happens, I think, here in this next section is very interesting because I believe it can equip us to help ourselves and if we really take the teaching on board to help other people who are struggling with this very issue. So join me as we look at the story of a woman called Sarai and the situation described for us in the first half of Genesis chapter 18. This part of the story we're going, is going to probably take four or five episodes and it will naturally fall into two parts. The first part of the story, we'll see some mysterious men appear. We'll talk about them in a second, but when they appear, Abraham is seen to offer up food and hospitality for them. Now, a great, a large part of this passage is going to be given over to the describing of the preparation of the meal for them. And it's interesting to me that so much attention is given to just giving the details of, of the preparing and the eating of the meal. But I suppose we shouldn't ignore this and understand that an underlying aspect of this story is trying to give us a, a reminder, a powerful reminder of the importance of the ministry of hospitality, a ministry that is indeed mentioned as a gift of the Holy Spirit, and one that I think is sometimes forgotten, ignored, or at least undervalued in many churches today. In the New Testament, Hebrews 13, 
tells us this. It says, Do not forget to show hospitality to strangers, for by doing so, some people will have shown hospitality to angels without knowing it. Wow. I wonder if that's what's going on here. So in the second half of the passage, which we'll come to later in the week, is there is going to be an announcement made by these men who will declare that Sarah, as she's called now, is going to have a son. So let's go back and look at the beginning, the opening of this text of chapter 18, where it tells us this. The Lord appeared to Abraham near the great trees of Mamre. While he was sitting there at the entrance of his tent in the heat of the day, Abraham looked up and he saw three men standing nearby. When he saw them, he hurried from the entrance of his tent to meet them and bowed low to the ground. The strangers in this story really are strangers in the sense of initially being unidentified. Strangers, now this word can also be translated as guests, but these are unusual guests, very strange strangers indeed. And just how unusual, how strange, well, we'll get to that and we'll discover that in the next episode. We discovered last time that these three strangers appear to Abraham while he's sitting at the entrance to his tent. So let's just remind ourselves of the opening text which said this in Genesis chapters 18 verses 1 and 2. The Lord appeared to Abraham near the great trees of Mamre. While he was sitting at the entrance to his tent in the heat of the day, Abraham looked up and saw three men, three men standing nearby. When he saw them, he hurried from the entrance of his tent to meet them and bow low to the ground. So Abraham looks up and he sees these three men approaching and then standing nearby. And when he sees them, he bows down before them. Now the strangers in the story uh, really are strangers in the sense that initially they're clearly unidentified. And I think the ambiguity of who they are is, is or at least who they are initially is important because when we all encounter someone new, they are, in a sense, initially, of course, a stranger to us. But it's important to remember that even a stranger has intrinsic natural rights and worth, and that's predicated on the, on the biblical concept that everyone, we are all created in the image of God, of God. Everyone, every human being has contained within them something of the Logos, the divine nature of God within them. Therefore, that also tells us all human beings must be respected, not only in relation to how we view ourselves, but in relation to how we view all other people, and even more so, one might, I would say, to strangers, and even more so to the marginalised in society. You know what, friends? Even the most hardened criminals have a touch of the divine in them. The divine spark is in them. And everybody must be treated with respect. And everybody must be considered as having the potential to be transformed by God. Without that, you become in great danger of developing an ever-increasing cynical view of the world. Never let go of that. Never forget that fact that everyone is worthy of of the love of God. And the idea being offered here is that everyone, strangers or otherwise, should be extended some form of hospitality. So anyway, Abraham knows what to do when these strangers appear and he bows down before them and he immediately offers them hospitality. He is determined to take a hospitable attitude towards them and welcome them. I think when you show trust particularly to a stranger, you by nature offer an opportunity to draw the best out of that other person. Doing so, in a sense, is a minor act of courage. It's like making a gesture that encourages the divine image that is in the other person to step forward. Even in the most challenging of person-to-person -person encounters and communication, the decision to reach out warmly as best you can means that conversation have the potential to be nurtured and God willing, maybe even restore someone. When you listen to people, when you listen to the stories of strangers, you learn something you didn't know before you met them. And that means you can 
go out into this world and you can, can treat that world of strangers as an endless vista of places where you can learn things, learn about things you didn't know and get to know people and get to find the divine image within those people. But did you notice that the opening verse of this passage, it says the Lord appeared to Abraham. Now it's a very important point to make because the word translated Lord, the, the phrase used is actually the personal name of God. It actually says in the original text, Yahweh appeared. Now we know Abraham was pitched under the oak tree at Mamre in the middle of the day. So it's the middle of the day, so obviously it's hot. And it then tells us, and if you look at the King James, it says Abraham looked up or he raised his eyes. Now many commentators suggest that this means he had been meditating or praying, but at any rate he raises up his eyes as the men approach him. And when he sees them, he rushes to the tent door to meet them, and he bows down before them, low to the ground. Now there are some nuances and shades of things being offered here. Doesn't this feel, in a sense, like a position of worship? It's helpful to understand exactly what is happening. He's standing at the door, or praying at the door of the tent when they approach, and initially these three uh, strangers, they just stand there. Now this was the normal custom. It's like someone coming to your door and knocking the door. They don't just go straight in. They wouldn't just come in and begin a conversation with you. They would wait until you stepped out and offered an invitation to enter. When God shows up at your door, friends, and he might do, it seems he's likely, the, the picture here suggests that he's likely to wait for you to let him in. So don't miss the opportunity if God appears at your door to invite him in. But in this situation, Abraham looks up, sees them, and he invites them to stay, to tarry a while. Now, before we continue in the text, I want to pause for a moment and talk some more about these three men and who they were. In verse three, as I said, sorry, in verse two, as I said, it just says three men. But verse 1 had already declared that the Lord appeared to him. Now general agreement across most Bible commentators is that one of these three men is in fact the Lord, the pre-incarnate Jesus himself. As a matter of fact, if you listen carefully when we get further into this passage, you'll notice in verse 13 it also says, And the Lord said to Abraham. So one of these three strangers who appear is definitely the Lord. Verse 1 here implies it, but verse 13 later, which we'll get to later, will confirm it. The other two men are angels, and that will also be confirmed later in the story, both later in this chapter and in fact in the one that follows. Anyway, I think it's really significant that one of them is in fact Christ the Lord, taking on the manifestation of, a, of human form of a person. This event, a Christophany as it's sometimes called, happens occasionally, but it happens several times in the Old Testament. So here we are, there are three men, including the Lord, and one of them speaks, and Abraham sees them and bows down before him. And then we will see that a conversation between them begins. But we'll take a look at what that conversation is and what it said and what it means in the next episode. Uh, looking at this passage in Genesis chapter 18, which I'm calling today's short message, A Conversation with Deity. So you remember last time that we established that these three men who appear, appeared at the tent of Abraham are the Lord himself and two angels. So let's begin by reminding us of what Abraham says to them. He said, I have found favour in your eyes, my Lord. Do not pass your servant by. Let a little water be brought, and then you may all wash your feet and rest under this tree. Let me get you something to eat so you can be refreshed and then go on your way. Now that you have come to your servant, very well, they answered. Do as you say. In other words, Abraham is seen here to extend hospitality to them, hospitality to them expressing it by offering to wash their feet and giving them something to eat. So he invites them in and they say yes. 
and then the text continues in verse 8 and it tells us so Abraham hurried into the tent to Sarah quick he said get three seas of the finest flour and knead it and bake some bread then he ran to the herd and selected a choice tender calf and gave it to a servant who hurried to prepare it he then brought some curds and milk and the calf that had been prepared he set these before them while they ate he stood near them under a tree so these verses tell us that Abraham tells Sarah to hurry and prepare some bread which was the equivalent of Bible times I suppose of fast food it told us earlier in the passage that it was the heat of the day meaning it was probably mid-afternoon and you see this is indirectly telling us that this is the time of day when there wouldn't normally be bread available bread wasn't usually cooked until later for the evening meal so the reason he's telling her to do this now is because he wants there wouldn't be any bread ready to serve straight away so he says to so he says to her we have some visitors so go make some bread and while she is doing that he then runs to the herd and picks out the best calf and he gives it to one of the servants to prepare for the evening feast please note only on special occasions did people eat beef at that time therefore Abraham must have viewed this as a very significant special event so the spe so the fatted calf is sent for meaning he selected the best calf and he tells it one of his young men to prepare the calf in butter and milk and serve it and as it is served to the three Abraham stands nearby in a sense almost waiting upon them and he's standing nearby under a tree now I'd like to just pause for a moment and talk about the fact that a lot of attention is given in this passage to the fact that what they were eating and how they were being treated as special guests and I think this is a is not to be overlooked you might say it's a critical part of the passage so why labour the point that they ate so well? Now I'm not alone in suggesting that the significance that lies in this is the fact that they are seen to be having fellowship. One com commentator I read said, and I quote, eating together was a sign of intimate fellowship, friendship in other words, in Abraham and in the culture that was prevalent at Abraham's time. So you see they're eating together in fellowship akin in a sense to sitting down together and eating and treating people as friends now in John 15 Jesus is referenced talking about friendship and he says this in John 15 verse 14 he says you are my friends if you do what I command you so you see this suggests to me there's a difference between being a believer and being a friend to be a believer in Jesus Christ we just have to trust in him but to be a friend of, of Christ, we have to go beyond that and we have to begin to start to obey the Lord also. And then Jesus in that passage talking in John went on to say, No longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing, but now I call you friends. For all things that I heard from my father, I have made known to you. You see, that's what happens when you have fellowship with the Lord. The Lord begins to reveal himself more and more to you like a friend. Now, would you like to be friends with the Lord? Well, Abraham did, and the tenor of this passage suggests that Abraham knew that the Lord and the two other angels must have come with some special message. His eagerness, we see him running around getting this fellowship meal prepared, I think implies that he was eager to know if they'd come to give him some kind of special message, a special message which he was clearly keen to hear. hear. Abraham really wants to know what's going to happen and what they're going to say. But before finishing this section today, I just want to pause for a moment and say that God also wants to have fellowship with you. God would love to sit down and in a sense have dinner with you, so to speak. The Lord really wants to have fellowship with you and I today. He wants to reveal his word to you, to share stuff with you, to share his plans with you, to sit down and sup with you as it says in the book of Revelation. Interested? Would you like to do that? Well, to begin that process, spend time with the Lord 
Spend time in his word, spend time in prayer, and the Lord God will reveal his truth to you. No question of that. That's the promise throughout the whole Bible. But in order to go into deeper and deeper into that friendship, when the Lord reveals stuff to you, you must begin to become obedient to him. And that's how we go from being a servant to a friend. Now that's the first part of the passage, and now it gets real. In verse 9 and 10, we'll see how Abraham responds and what is revealed to him. And we'll pick that up in the next episodes. And we're in the text of Genesis chapter 18, looking at this uh, amazing chapter where the three angels, one of which we believe is the Lord Jesus Christ, appears before Abraham with news. And this is the point where they bring Sarah into the equation of some amazing news for Sarah. So I'm going to read, begin to read to you from chapter 18, verses 9 and 10. But I'd just like to remind you before we do that, that the full transcript of all of these podcasts is always available on any audio version of the podcast in the show notes or the episode notes section, wherever you happen to find it. So here we go. Genesis 18, verses 9 and 10 says this. So this is the one of the angels speaking. Where is your wife, Sarah? They asked him. There in the tent, he said. Then one of them said, I will surely return to you about this time next year. And Sarah, your wife, will have a son. Now, do you think they already knew where Sarah was when they asked that question? Well, I would say, of course, they knew where she was because she was right behind them in the tent. They were outside the tent, these three uh, visitors, under a tree, and she was inside the tent preparing the meal, as we found out last time. I believe they knew exactly where she was, not least because of their close proximity to her, but also from the fact of the matter of who, in reality, these three strangers were. It's also worth noting that it was the custom of the day for a wife to be in the tent, so that would have been expected. So they call Sarah by name. So they knew who she was and they probably knew where she was when they did that. Now when I read this passage I can't help but be reminded of, and maybe you are reminded of it also, of that text of of Adam in the Garden of Eden where we heard God come to Adam and say, where are you? That was in Genesis 3 verse 9. God on that occasion also knew where Adam was of course, And I believe the Lord and the angels also know where Sarah is at this point. What they're doing here is asking a rhetorical question. They're doing this in order to get her attention and to engage her. So look at verse 10 and they say this to him, I will return to you about this time next year. Now don't miss that. This means by the same time next year, Sarah and Abraham are going to have had the baby. I'm going to come back to you about that time, about this time next year, Sarah, and and telling Abraham at that point, your wife will have had a son. Now, Sarah was listening at the tent of the door and could hear this entire conversation, which is why we are told, and she's speaking to herself here, Abraham and Sarah were already very old and Sarah was past the age of childbearing. So Abraham is 99 years old, which means he will have to have a son when he's 100. And Sarah is 90 years old when she's going to have this child. So no doubt she's thinking to herself something along the lines of, are you kidding me? This is impossible. Which is why it tells us in verse 12, says Sarah laughed to herself as she thought, after I am worn out and my Lord is old, will I now have this pleasure? So Sarah is seen to laugh. Now, please note that this doesn't necessarily mean that she laughed out loud. In fact, some Bible experts I've read say the words, particular words used here, suggest that what she did was she laughed within herself. Now, this is important. And now, this is important if you recognise that she was hidden from them, which means she couldn't hear or read the body language. She only heard the conversation, but she laughs, and this is what. She says to herself, she asks herself this question, how, when we are both worn out, will I finally experience such joy? So Sarah is thinking, you know what, I'm way too old for this childbearing thing. 
That's why she probably laughs to herself thinking, come on, this isn't going to happen. Which is why in verse 13 we are told, Then the Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh and say, I, Will I really have a child whenever I am old? Now, she hadn't said anything out loud here. She didn't even laugh out loud. And Abraham himself probably hadn't realised that she'd laughed at all. But now he did because the Lord and the strangers tell him that she laughed. Now you may recall back a few episodes back when we looked at chapter 17 when Abraham was told this by God himself that he was going to have a son through Sarah he laughed as well but you may also recall in those episodes I suggested that I agreed with most of the Bible commentators who said that the particular laugh on that occasion was actually a laugh of incredulous joy the language suggests that it's not a scornful laugh on Abraham's behalf because we also noted while he laughed he was seen to fall face down in front of the Lord upon doing that. And most Bible experts and commentators who know about these things say the use of the words that were suggested this time with the laugh of Sarah is a laugh of incredulous doubt, doubting that the Lord can do it. It's a laugh of unbelief. I don't think it's a scornful laugh, as you may find some people suggest. I don't even think she's ridiculing God or her husband. I think she's really just saying something like, right, uh, really, and laughing because of what how incredulous this situation seems. In fact, she's laughing with the very idea that such a thing could happen. So how is the Lord going to address this? Well, we find out next time in the next episode and we're in this point of the story in Genesis chapter 18 where we see Sarah respond to the Lord's uh, statement about her having a child and she tells the lie and I think there's some really useful insights some help that will give us that can give us as ever we are tempted to tell a lie so you may remember last time we saw Sarah's reaction to the Lord's declaration that her and Abraham were going to have a child, but it was going to happen in extreme old age. She laughed. Now, as I said last time, it wasn't a scornful laugh, probably more a laugh of incredulous disbelief. So how does the Lord react to Sarah's response? Well, the first thing he does is he asks Sarah, why is she laughing? He points out her, to her that her incredulity is in essence a form of doubting. She's doubting what the Lord has said he's going to do. Now I believe that part of the way that we all can deal with doubt is we should recognise that it is doubt and call it by its name. In other words, she was questioning the ability of God to do what he had promised to do. And of course, by nature, that means she was doubting the Lord. Sarah, by thinking, I'm too old for this, got she got her thinking about her physical circumstances, her physical situation, rather than the promise of God to do that which seemed possible. Now, his reply to Sarah's reply is in the next verse which says this and this is one of the classic statements friends one of the classic statements in the bible when it comes to dealing with the issue of unbelief we hear the lord say in genesis 18 verse 14 is anything too hard for the lord i will return at the appointed time next year and sarah will have a son so next time you may be tempted to doubt the Lord because you're looking at your circumstances rather than rather than doubting the Lord, friends, just say to yourself what it says here, is anything too hard for the Lord? Because of course, no, it's not. So there is no need to doubt. The way you deal with doubt, I believe we're being told here is to recognize that no matter what's going on, always remember that in all circumstances, if it's in his will, nothing is too hard for the Lord. Now we all have the doubt. We all have the tendency to doubt the Lord at times. John Stott in his famous Tyndale commentary on this passage says, Doubt or unbelief is not a misfortune to be pitied. 
It is, a, it is a sin to be deplored. Its sinfulness lies in the fact that it contradicts the word of the one true God and thus attributes falsehood to him. So when you doubt the Lord, the solution to uncertainty is to remember, as I said, nothing's too hard for the Lord. Don't be like Sarah and look at your own physical inabilities. What she should have been doing, what we should have been doing, is looking at God's abilities, focusing on God's power. Now maybe at, it is at this point in the story that Sarah finally realises that she's not dealing with just an ordinary person, but she's dealing with the Lord himself. God has the power to do what he's promised, so if you're thinking about your circumstances, you're not thinking about the Lord. So how did Sarah respond to that? Well, sadly, we'll find out that she lied and she actually denied that she laughed. It tells us in 1815, Sarah was afraid, so she lied and said, I did not laugh, but he said, yes, you did laugh. So she out and out denies that she was doubting and says, I didn't laugh, and this is a full face lie, friends. Now, why would she do that? Why do you think she lied? Well, the scripture helpfully tells us why she did it, and it says she lied because she was afraid. But God steps in firmly and fairly says, no, Sarah, you did lie, and you did in fact laugh. Talk about exposing the truth. Talk about God exposing the truth of, to who someone is and what their motivations are doing and why they did it. Very clear here. Now, I believe there's a really interesting and helpful thought to be pulled out of this verse 15. If we ask the question, why did she lie? And we see that the answer is because she was afraid. And I think it's interesting to think about that for a minute. Think about times in the past when maybe you've told a lie. Did you ever say something that wasn't true? And then afterwards maybe wondered, why did I say that? Did you ever misrepresent a partial truth as the whole truth, more subtle, but just as just as wrong. The answer is, if you did those things, it's very likely you did them because at heart you were afraid of something. You did it because things were not going the way you wanted and you doubted and thereby you doubted that the Lord could work that situation to his purposes. So the next time you feel tempted to tell a lie or even deliberately misrepresent a half-truth, just pause for a moment and prayerfully ask yourself the question, what is it I'm afraid of here, Lord? That's a really useful, helpful, personal insight found here in this ancient wisdom. It's amazing. If you grab hold of this piece of wisdom, well, friends, you could probably save yourself thousands of pounds in psychiatry and psychology, psychotherapy bills. So the next time you may be tempted to lie, think about what's really going on at that point and ask yourself what I'm afraid of. And if you find that you have a problem and you're a persistent liar, prayerfully ask yourself, what is the fear that's driving me to make those wrong choices? Is it a fear that you're not accepted by people or worse still, underneath that you're not accepted by the Lord? You see, a lie may not only damage you, but it will also damage your relationship with other people. And if it is a lie about other people, it will probably dam damage the other people and their relationships with other people. So you see Sarah here, out of fear, told a lie and denied her actual unbelief. She denied that she doubted the Lord. But most seriously, and this is where it's really important to take note, by doing so, she then attributed the lie to the Lord. What was true of herself is flipped and becomes an accusation against the Lord. And by doing such a thing, she's telling a lie in the most wor in the worst imaginable way. She's not attributing the lie to herself or to another person. She's attributing the lie to the Lord. It was not the Lord who lied that day, she did. That's the story up to here and we'll finish the study of this chapter by trying to draw some conclusions when we come back here tomorrow, next time. 
and we're closing out this first uh, part of Genesis chapter 18. Uh, they're covering the first 15 verses, verses of chapter 18 and this is the section where I'm drawing it to a conclusion and looking at the reasons anyone including us might tell lies and what I'm trying to do today is draw some conclusions out of this story where uh, the three strangers appear to Abraham and by nature also to Sarah. So let's try and draw some conclusions and pull this all together. You'll remember that when the Lord appeared to Abraham and announced to him that his wife would bear a son, Sarah, his wife, was listening at the back of the tent and it says that she laughed. Now, what I want you to take out of this passage this time and in a sense, you know, stick in your spiritual back pocket, so to speak, and carry with you as we exit this first half of Genesis chapter 18 is a very simple but an invaluable piece of biblical truth that contained with here is a way to deal with doubt whether it's your own doubt or to help someone else who is struggling with doubt you see when we doubt we tend to focus on our own circumstances and the solution to, to, to doubt is not to look within ourselves but to look at God's word to look at God's promises and also to look at the power of God, what he's capable of doing. Don't focus on your own circumstances, friends. At the beginning of this chapter, uh, in the beginning of this section of this chapter, which we covered, if you remember, we've covered the first 15 verses of chapter 18. I brought up the fact that most people think doubting or what may sometimes gets mixed up with unbelief. And they think it applies to the big theological ideas, the, ba the main tenets of the faith. But that's not what we're talking about here when we consider the area of doubt. Those things lie in the domain of unbelief, which is a different thing. It's not doubt. Only non-Christians suffer from unbelief. They have unbelief about whether God is real or whether Jesus is really God's son or whether they believe the Bible is in fact true or even the word of God. Now those issues, those issues of unbelief can be addressed by the Holy Spirit through evangelism and discipleship, that's our part in it, by first of all getting people to hand over their lives to Christ in repentance and faith and then following it up with discipleship. In other words, training them working with them together in perfecting their faith through the study and application of God's word. But what I'm talking about here is something different, and it is a very real problem for many Christian believers, and that is doubt. Now, the main doubt that I see that many Christians suffer for is one where they struggle doubting that or believing that God has really and truly and completely forgiven them. And I want to end this section by quoting a very important verse from the Bible. Just one verse, which is 1 John chapter 1, verse 7, where it says this. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Isn't that great? Isn't that fantastic? If we ever were to doubt that God has forgiven us, this reminds us that the blood of Jesus cleanses you, not from most of your sins. Did you notice it didn't say the blood of Jesus covers 95% of your sins or 95% or 99% of your sins? There is no sin that the blood of Jesus does not cover. The blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses us from all sin. Now, just in case you think there's something in your life that's not covered by God's forgiveness, let me remind you of a few people that God not only forgave, but he went on to use greatly. Moses, Moses was a murderer. Remember that. Wow. Moses was a murderer, yet he was forgiven and God used him greatly. David was an adulterer and a plotter and a schemer, and yet he was forgiven. Peter the disciple, he denied the Lord. He denied the Lord just before his death, and yet he too was forgiven. And the Apostle Paul, he was persecuting Christians and the kill, even the killing of Stephen, and yet he found grace sufficient 
for forgiveness for all of his sins. You see, friends, if you look to your sin, if you focus on your sin, if you concentrate on your situations, you will doubt. But if you focus on the Lord, you pay attention to his word, you need not be afraid or doubt because the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses you and I from all our sins. Now, just to conclude, let me remind you of the last verse of this passage, Genesis 18, verse 15, which said, Sarah was afraid, so she lied and said, I did not laugh. But the Lord then said, you did laugh, Sarah. Yes, you did. And the story from the, at this point, it seems to end on a rather sad point, doesn't it? Where it finishes with the fact that Sarah lied. So I wonder if she ever got this. Do you think she ever got past the lies and the mistakes that she made here? Was she ever able to face up to it and get over it and move on? Well, let me read to you from a New Testament book called Hebrews from chapter 11, a section which is sometimes called the Great Role of Faith, where all the great heroes of the faith are listed one after another. And you know what? Sarah appears in there. Let me read to you from Hebrews 11, beginning in verse 8. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith, he dwelt in the land of promise as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Here we are. By faith, Sarah herself also received strength to conceive seed, and she bore a child when she was past the age, because she judged him faithful who had promised. Therefore, one man and him as good as dead were born as many as the stars of the sky in multitude, innumerable as the sand by which is by the seashore. Sarah judged him faithful, in other words, Sarah judged God faithful and true to his promise. There you go, friends. That's great stuff. That is the solution to doubt. Sarah doubted and then she made things even worse by not admitting that she doubted. And she even lied about it and tried to turn it on its head and blame God. But in the end, God still judged her faithful and he fulfilled all his promises through her. And he can do that for you also. Okay, that's it for today. Thanks for joining me. We'll begin to look together at the second part of this important chapter, Genesis chapter 18, in the next episode. So I'll see you soon, back here very soon. And it's bye for now from the Daily Bible Project podcast. <laughs>